Thank you everyone for joining me today. Um, this is the Hopkins Centre In Focus Online Research Seminar and the third in the series. My name is Professor Elizabeth Kendall. I'm the Director of the Hopkins Centre and I'm going to be your host for today, at least for a little while before I hand over. Um, I believe we have several hundred people live streaming this event today, so all over Australia, so that's really exciting. Um, and it is an event that is a replacement, a COVID replacement for our Bold Ideas Better Solutions Symposium, which we hold every year and we were very sad not to be able to hold it this year. So these events have been terrific for us to get online. So just uh, before I begin, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. Uh, I pay my respects to the elders of the land on which I'm working, which happens to be the Yugam Bay people. And I live in the area of the Mananjali tribe, uh, a very important group in our local area. And I pay my respects also to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and thank them for the uh, contribution that they always make to the Hopkins Centre and to all of our projects. And we hope that our work is always respectful. Um, we have some very important sponsors today and I've just had a little demonstration of how important they are. Um, these sponsors, Cisco Webex uh, and Cisco Partners, just so important to make these online events successful. So really thank you and Jason, thank you for all your help uh, in making this a success because it's very, very hard to make these online events flow smoothly. And I'm sure they won't, but if you have any technical difficulties, we'll, we'll get to what you can do in a moment. So first of all, um, we can um, enable captions if you need them. So, and I think that's a really important thing that we offer that in this system. So if you want captions, you can probably see a button on the bottom right toolbar um, and you have to choose English or whatever other language you'd like to see those captions in and the captions will come up underneath the event. So please, um, if you can't access captions, um, please make sure that you send a message in the chat and uh, we can um, see what, what can go wrong. Jason will be there to help. So um, if you can't find the chat function, uh, it's also down uh, on the bottom right of your screen on the toolbar, and you'll be able to see a blue bubble uh, over, right over on the right. And if you click on the blue bubble, you can type any chat that you like into the message. And I think most people these days are very accustomed to using chat. So please put in your questions, any questions you have. Um, and we can make sure they'll be they'll be available for the audience and for the speakers. We are recording these events, um, so that that presentation will be up on our website uh, in coming days, along with the other two events. So if you haven't already seen those events, please click onto the website and have a look. Um, if you're having any technical details, uh, technical difficulties at all. Just email the Hopkins Centre at griffith.edu.au and I think that's up on your screen there now. Or stick a comment in the chat and I know that Makala will be listening uh, and watching behind the scenes to get things fixed up and make everything run well. So this is the third online event that we've run um, to replace our Bold Ideas Better Solutions Symposium. And it, it was a terribly sad thing not to be able to run that Bibs Symposium. We enjoy that every year. We have lots of great visitors and a huge attendance, and it's a very warm and friendly event. So it was very sad not to be able to do that and instead to have to work in this online environment that's a little bit unusual and, uh, and it's hard to engage with your audience really well. So, um, this is this is exciting to us. We've had great turnout, and again, as I said, a few hundred people uh, on this event live streaming. So maybe this is something that we'll keep up in the Hopkins Centre in future, anyway. And I can hear Makala groaning in the background. So uh, let's get on to today's event rather than me waste a lot of your time. 
if um, if COVID has taught us anything this year, it's been that we need to think differently about the future. We need to think about what that future could be like in disability and rehabilitation services, because we just can't respond well it, in times of pandemic or other crises. And that does that sort of crisis does not make the need for rehabilitation and disability support services go away. It actually increases the need for those services and the need for us to um, support people with disabilities and help them to remain engaged with their social connections. And there were a lot of challenges this year making that happen. I think our panel discussion today will really highlight some of these issues and will really focus on the future and what it could look like in disability and rehabilitation services. Um, it's about the next generation and, and making a vision for rehabilitation that's that's inclusive, adaptable, but also resilient and able to withstand the shocks uh, that may come our way in future. So I am going to hand out over to our panel facilitator, who I will first introduce to you. Uh, Morris, Mr. Morris Mizalowski, I'll get you to turn on your camera, Morris. Um, now, Morris, when I met Morris last year, um, his title is a futurist. And I thought, what an amazing future, what an amazing title to have. It's just a wonderful title. And I wanted a title like that. It's a it's terrific title to have. And true to his title, Morris has been a futurist for us. He's helping us to think in the future about disability and rehabilitation. He's uh, really challenging some of the things that we uh, hold as fact and helping us to do things differently. So Morris um, is, is uh, someone who has an amazing way of thinking. He is one of the only Australian futurists who's joined the Einstein 100 Genius Collective, which sounds also really exciting to be a part of. And these are people who were noted for pushing the boundaries, noted for extending what is possible. And that is what Morris has been doing for most of his life. He's uh, been an entrepreneur since he was a teenager when most of us are just struggling to really work out who we are. Um, he's been an academic, he's a marketing professional and a chaplain even in prison. So that was news to me. Um, he's interviewed some of the most interesting people in the world and today he's going to interview four really amazing people in disability and rehabilitation who I know already make a difference and think really well about the future. So I am going to mute myself and hand over to you, Morris. Thank you so much for today. Elizabeth, I never want you to mute yourself. Thank you very, very much. And thank you to all of you for joining us online. I would absolutely love if you can prove that you are out there for us by just going over to the chat and popping in a hi or a hello, just so that we can have some touch of semblance with you. I'm thrilled that we are together this afternoon on the eve of what will be tomorrow, International Day of Persons with Disability. This afternoon, I want us to look ahead, which as a futurist, I'm constantly doing, trying to discover and make sense of the world ahead. For me, it's always a human first exploration because I believe our core as humans have not changed since we were put on this planet, whomever and whenever that was. But what one of our cores is, our fundamental core is health and wellness. And that's why over the last 30 years, in a broad landscape of other conversations, I've always kept one eye on the future of health and wellness. And the changes have been incredible over the last 30 or 40 years. And of course, as we've lived through the last 12 months, we have seen the most extraordinary changes some, of course, are terrible and have brought us with nothing but sadness. This afternoon, I want us to look ahead, though. I want us to see beyond the misery of today and what we've lived through into the possibilities of tomorrow and look at what COVID legacy might be and also what 20, 30, 10 years from now might be in the area of rehabilitation and resilience. 
In the recent video I put together in the year 2040, looking at rehabilitation and what it might become, I spoke about the possibilities of prehabilitation, of using nanobots, of using digital twins, of understanding what exoskeletons might be able to achieve for us, all in the context of rehabilitation practitioners, using these as instruments, as tools, nothing more than screwdrivers and hammers of old, fulcrums made from sticks. These are tools in the wisdom and careful and deliberate hands of our most wonderful practitioners, you. Today will not be a conversation about technology. I don't wish to spend time bowing at the feet of it. We will, of course, include it. But what is most important in this and every conversation we have are the humans, you and I, our end users, our patients, our practitioners, our clinicians, our researchers, and everybody else involved. What does the world ahead look for us? I'm thrilled to say that this afternoon I'm joined on that journey by The reality is that together we're going to look at what an inclusive, adaptable and resilient rehab system might look like. And I'm excited to be joined by four preeminent practitioners, thinkers and achievers. Together we'll journey through today and then land in 2030 for a spirited conversation of what re rehabilitation might become, do and offer on the 2nd of December 2030. So, without further ado, I want to introduce the first of our panellists, Dr. Elizabeth, uh, Dr. Alyssa Farrow, Rehabilitation Medicine Physician, Sunshine Coast Hospital and Health Services, and Co-Chair Statewide Rehabilitation Clinical Network. So, firstly, welcome to you, Alyssa. Thanks, Morris. Hi. As, as Morris said, I am a Rehabilitation Medicine Physician. Uh, based at the Sunshine Coast Health Hospital and Health Service and have been here for the last six years. Um, I've been very lucky in the sense that I, in my very short career, have had the chance to lead and be involved with the transition process in itself. Um, and that, that process of dreaming big and future planning and then having that tempered by the budget constraints and historical biases that we sometimes get in our workplaces. Uh, I'm very passionate about rehab services and have a particular focus on equity and access, but would be the first to say that that doesn't mean I believe that they have to be the same mode of care for everyone. And in fact, that for an individual, their, their rehab and their rehab experience needs to be tempered and, and developed based on their needs and their goals, and that we need a flexible set of options in order to achieve that. It's more that they need to be able to access that wherever they are and wherever they're from. In, I have a long history in my relatively short career of, of quite significant advocacy, and that's within training, education, and also from a service profile perspective and from a service delivery perspective. Um, I believe very strongly in consumer focus and co-design whenever we're building something for the future. And I have been a founding member of the Statewide Rehab Clinical Network Steering Committee um, and have been co-chair since 2019, which you know, it was great timing in some ways, um, as it provided an opportunity to see and advocate for change in a time when it's been greatly needed. And I guess at the end of the day, all of that's said in a background of, of having three small children who like to remind me on a regular basis about and set an example for me in the sense that they love to challenge the norm and they like to challenge my notions of stability and they love to push barriers and they help me refocus my priorities on a daily basis. And I think that's a really important message for me to take through and, and for me to then try and live by when I'm in work and when I'm in my role as a co-chair. I would absolutely agree. I always advocate for all of my clients and audiences to see the world in a childlike way because children haven't learned that things aren't possible. Children don't <laughs> understand why things can't be done. And really for all of us, we're often too caught up in the pragmatism of what we do and the realism of how difficult it might be to make a change. But nevertheless, that doesn't make it less true that change has to happen. So I think three kids would just multiply that by three. Now, what, what, what was the gravitational pull that brought you to your specialty? Why do you do what you do? Oh, I am a very firm believer in quality of life and really optimising the life we get to lead. 
Um, I worked in all sorts of different areas. I, I did some emergency work actually in Ireland for six months and it was there that I decided that rehab was definitely the area for me because I hated seeing these poor people coming back through emergency and not having that opportunity to really optimise and expand on their life and find that new normal and, and you know, get, feel that community integration again. So I was really pulled to it based on that quality of life and also I love working within a multidisciplinary team. I, I quite enjoy the input from all the areas. I like um, that shared uh, sort of accountability, that shared responsibility of working through with someone in that journey as, as our patients come through. And I love seeing what happens at the end of a journey. I'm not great at just dealing with the front end. I like to see the back end. I like to see what happens after, you know, the fairy tale moment and the recovery and the instant return to life. I like to see the actual living of the life. When we chatted before, you made a most incredible comment and we were talking about COVID and its impacts this year on you and your practice and your activities. And one of the things you said to me, which has stuck with me since, and I'd love you to explore just a little bit more for us this afternoon, is you said that in some ways you thought that regional rehabilitation had been better able to cope with the COVID crisis than perhaps some of our city or capital city counterparts. Why, why did you come to that thought? A couple of reasons, and I, and I should caveat that with the fact that I think our statewide services already had lots of things in place and were already doing virtual rehab and tele-rehab um, within their programs in order to service the whole state. Um, but when it came to initiating and implementing changes in a really rapid fashion, I do think that the regional centres were faster adopters in that sense and have more of that capabilities. I think it came down to a few things. I, in some ways, being in a big tertiary facility is wonderful. We have lots of opportunities. We have lots of subspecialty input. However, it's a very big team. There is a lot of like lot higher risk of siloing and it can be harder to, to really build that into professional team uh, sort of dynamic. Whereas I think the peripheral sites and the regional sites, the smaller teams are already doing that sort of practice. So when COVID hit and we needed to reshape what we were doing, rethink what we were doing, I think a lot of teams were able to just leap forward and take on different roles and different activities because they're already open to that. I also think when you have fewer people and you have fewer reserves, you just need to get creative all the time. Because even in a non-COVID time, you're under-resourced, you're under the hammer, you're having to think differently. And so, you know, they're already open to that change and to that opportunity. I think education is also sometimes easier to coordinate in the smaller groups. And I really do think there's something to be said for the red tape situation. And, and I work, I'm a full public physician. I work in Queensland Health, a very proud public physician. I love what I do and I love the, the patient cohort that I work with. Um, but I do sometimes think that that change process can be very challenging within a large organisation. And I think that you, it's paramount that you have that support from an exec when you're trying to build and change things quickly. And COVID just stripped away red tape. It, it just completely obliterated, you know, that need for the working group and the, and the concept briefs and the things like that. I mean, we're still doing them, but the approval times went through the roof and projects that people were talking about doing for years suddenly got fast tracked. And it also meant that the clinicians themselves didn't have time to worry about that adaptability and, and how would they cope with that? It was just upon us. And so that that had a big impact too. Yeah, we certainly have. I mean, as everybody can attest listening to this, lived through extraordinary times. And I look forward to meeting, to, for us discussing with the other panellists in a few moments what some of those ramifications and possibilities are. So thank you again, and I look forward to coming back to you in just a few moments. The next of our incredible panel is Professor Philip Morris. He's an adjunct professor at the Queensland University of Technology's Institute of Health and Biomedical Innovation. And I welcome him to our screens and hearing more about his background. Welcome. Thanks, Morris, and, uh, and hi, everyone. Um, I'm, like everybody, many things, um, but I have been an academic and a biomedical researcher for many, many years, although formally I've been retired for the last 11 years. But my reason for being here today is because of my role as an advocate for people with disabilities and particularly people with uh, spinal cord injuries. And the reason 
that I'm an advocate for, for disability is that in 2005 I broke my neck and that left me uh, a quadriplegic. Um, I've made a remarkable uh, recovery or rehabilitation, um, but I think it's really important to distinguish between rehabilitation and recovery. Um, things like spinal cord injuries you generally don't recover from, you have to learn to live with them. Um, but because of my experiences, um, I'm now very passionate about trying to improve the, the clinical support services, um, the, uh, the general treatment and management of people with disabilities so that they can uh, achieve the best possible outcomes and uh, lead empowered, fulfilling lives. So I'll, I'll leave it there, Morris. That's probably enough about me. So it's extraordinary. And the other thing you've done, Philip, is you've redefined what retirement means. Because I'm, I think you're busier in the last 11 years than you were in the, in the years previous to that. Which, which is my notion of what retirement should be in some ways. Well, I think anybody in retirement should keep busy. And uh, I'm certainly doing that. So again, in our discussion, you mentioned something that made me think quite deeply about why it was so. And you challenged me to think about when true rehabilitation begins and why. Can you expand on that? Sure. Um, as I said, I think it's important to distinguish between rehabilitation and recovery. Um, most of the clinical services are focused on the acute phase when people are um, in hospital, they're recovering from an injury or, um, or, or surgery. And for things like a hip replacement or a knee replacement, you undergo uh, rehabilitation and usually you make a full recovery and, and lead a normal life. Disorders like spinal cord injury, acquired brain injury, um, no matter how successful the acute phase rehabilitation, you're always left with significant lifelong um, deficits uh, and disabilities. And so um, for me, that acute phase, the hospital phase of rehabilitation is incredibly important to get you through that period. But uh, real rehabilitation doesn't start until you actually go home. And, and uh, for me, and I think for most people with those um, lifelong disorders, rehabilitation is a lifetime process. Um, and it really starts once you go home. So it's not so much about recovery. It's about adapting to your new life, to, to your current situation, and making the most of that life. And later on, if there's uh, time, I've got a couple of case studies that illustrate um, a good example and a bad example of how people have adapted or failed to adapt to their new life. Look forward to hearing those. And again, for many of our listeners, viewers, not a surprise, but what you've done is to highlight already the notion that we're talking about a lifelong activity. This is not a moment in time or moments in time. That rehabilitation is something that remains with the person forever in one way or another. So thank you for doing that. And I look forward again to bring you back into the panel, the larger panel, in just a few moments we, as we meet our next uh, as we meet our next panelist. I'd like to introduce us all to Associate Professor Libby Calloway, who is an occupational therapist and Associate Professor for Occupational Therapy and, Real and Rehabilitation Department at Monash University. Welcome, Libby. Thanks, and hello, everyone. It's great to be here this afternoon at another wonderful Hopkins Centre event. Um, so, yes, as Philip said, I'm an, uh, as I'm a, Morris said, I'm an occupational therapist. Um, I have worked for about 27 years now in the field of neurological rehabilitation, primarily with people with spinal cord injury and traumatic brain injury. But for about the last 20 years, I've uh, moved into uh, a, a mixed role of clinical work 
and research uh, at Monash University. So I continue to have a private practice uh, working in the community with people uh, with severe brain injury and spinal cord injury, as well as leading a research program that's focused um, around housing, technology and workforce uh, design uh, based on people's goals for exactly what Philip just described, how they would like to live their life, what they want their life to look like, um, particularly for people living with neurological disability. Uh, so my work really started in the uh, acute and, and inpatient rehabilitation setting um, and I made a decision to go over to the USA and work in one of their major trauma centres there really to look at the impact of particularly insurance models and government policy on rehabilitation. Uh, and I returned to Australia in the early 2000s and started a private practice. But I guess that insurance interface and, and government policy has become so central to the way rehabilitation is delivered in Australia now. Uh, and a lot of my work um, is funded by the National Disability Insurance Agency or the other state-based injury insurers looking at uh, policy that can really drive um, person-centred outcomes that um, are, are linked to a person's goals and things they'd like to achieve. What brought you, what was the gravitational pull that brought you to this field? Um, I uh, actually start, was studying occupational therapy by chance. I wanted to be a physiotherapist and didn't quite get the marks. And fortuitously for my career, uh, I, I fell into OT. But at that time, while I was studying OT, I actually started working as a disability support worker with a man who had been in a road accident and sustained a very severe brain injury. And I worked with him for the four years of my undergraduate um, occupational therapy degree. And it just reinforced to me um, the importance of lifetime rehabilitation, as you've just been pointing to and really quality um, person-centred supports that are delivered in the environments that the person lives out their life every day, so at home or at work or um, in schools. And so that really reinforced and cemented my decision to stay in the field of neurotrauma uh, and to also then move into that research work that it can inform both policy and practice. Well, we're glad you stuck at it so you could join us this afternoon for the incredible work that you've done over the decades. Part of the work that you do is very much around technology. Technology is a tool, I understand, not as an end result in and of itself. But give me your thoughts on why you believe technology is an enabling facility that allows a more agile and resilient rehabilitation system to occur. I think Alyssa and Philip already touched on this, but we have seen um, the real enablement technology can offer um, to ensure people stay connected to the rehabilitation they require, regardless of where they are. And, and one of the very exciting elements this year has been seeing more people being able to harness telepractice supports in rehabilitation. Uh, and I really acknowledge Queensland's work in this space, and Alyssa pointed to the sort of regional remote services that have existed, particularly in the larger states like Queensland. But we're seeing now that technology can keep people connected to rehabilitation, regardless of where they are. I think the other thing, though, is it can also help people to really um, build um, not only their own capability through rehabilitation, but also think about the capability of um, allied health professionals they're working with in rehabilitation. And some of our more recent work has been working with state government to look at developing online um, interfaces, technologies that can help people with disability to rate the services that they're receiving um, in their rehabilitation to give feedback to clinicians on areas that are working well and opening up that two-way dialogue uh, so that, again, supports can be very much co-designed and delivered in the way that the person wants them to be. Thank you for that. I look forward to exploring those themes in just a couple of moments as the panel comes back together. I want to bring on the last of our entourage this afternoon, and that's Professor John Olver, AMMB, Yes, MD, and he's a consultant physician in rehabilitation medicine and a professor in rehabilitation medicine in the Department of Medicine at Monash University. And if that wasn't enough, and also a medical director of rehabilitation at Epworth Healthcare in Melbourne. Thank you, John, for joining us. Thank you, Morris. Um, well, you, you're right. I've always um, been very clear that I'm a clinician first and do research second. Uh, but I have been uh, Medical Director of Rehabilitation at Epworth for some years and my main clinical areas are traumatic brain injury, concussion and some of the uh, issues that uh, arise from them with muscle spasticity, etc. and setting up clinics to manage all of those things. Um, 
It's really been in the last 10 years that I've had the opportunity of having a chair of rehabilitation based at Monash and initiated uh, by Epworth and therefore been able to not only get on with some research looking at long-term outcomes, particularly after traumatic brain injury, but also now be able to bring up um, uh, new both therapists and uh, doctors uh, into the research world and see how important it is to question what you're doing by looking at um, outcomes. I've also had the opportunity as I'm currently a me the medical director of the Australian Rehabilitation Outcomes Centre, um, which collects a lot of data on outcomes, particularly in the inpatient, uh, from all um, rehabilitation hospitals in Australia and New Zealand, or about 96% of them anyway, um, uh, in both the public and private sector. So that gives you a sort of an overview of um, uh, how successful our, uh, our programs have been. Uh, so I've been doing this uh, particularly traumatic brain injury for about 35 years. And every time you think you've got it right, the next patient comes in. So it's very much a, uh, still a learning curve after all of this time. But we have progressed in the way we are probably a lot more patient-centred and have a lot more resources than we did uh, 30 plus years ago. And extraordinary to think, which is what we're going to do in just a couple of moments of what it might be like in 30 years from now. Absolutely. But what was it that brought you and kept you in the work that you're doing? Well, I think um, during my training, I did a term, uh, I think it was in second year, meds the second year out after my intern year uh, at a rehabilitation hospital. And what particularly um, interested me is that for the first time I was thinking beyond the impairment, the damage to an organ, whether it be a stroke or a heart attack or whatever, and was looking at um, how it affected the individual, what we call disability or in the modern term, it's activity limitation, and then looking beyond that at how it affected their daily lives. Uh, so the sort of functional outcomes of uh, our medical treatment uh, were the thing that rehabilitation particularly focused on that I wasn't seeing in, in the more acute uh, medical terms I did. Uh, and that was really what um, attracted me to, to a career in rehabilitation medicine. Now, I'm going to do something no presenter should do. I'm going to read. In yesterday's paper, in the Herald Sun, I'm from Melbourne, in the Herald Sun there was this comment which said, big backflippers, unhealthy merger gets scrapped. And I'm just going to pull out a paragraph. The new Department of Families, Fairness and Housing will support the child protection, prevention of family violence, housing and disability portfolio. It will also be... and the Office for Women's and Youth. This spoke to a new ministry or the large ministry that we have in Victoria being broken down and split into two. And as I read it, the only person I could think of was you because you made a comment to me in our discussion the other week that you weren't quite sure who was responsible for rehabilitation in the federal government. Can you give us a few thoughts on that? Well, I probably can't name names now because I'm a bit out of the political uh, career now, but. I mean, we've always known that rehabilitation is part of uh, health, the health department. So it's, we're, we're um, aligned with our acute colleagues. And that's fine because a lot of our work uh, initially in acute hospitals or in rehabilitation comes from our acute medical units and the immediate rehabilitation in a number of different areas. But over the years, we've expanded more and more into the community. And it becomes a little unclear then as to whether we're a health service or a disability service. Uh, and so sometimes we get a little bit lost uh, in, the, in, in the acute health sector and we butt our heads up a, a little bit against uh, other departments such as disability or aged care and disability. And so that can be difficult in, in planning uh, units. So I think the issue is that we span more than one department and that can be problematic when we try and plan um, sort of new services. Uh, NDIS, for example, specifically precludes uh, rehabilitation medicine as I would practice it because it's a, it's a health related um, activity. Uh, uh, whereas if I see a head injury patient for review and we see them for review for up to 20 or now 30 years post injury, uh, is that um, 
an acute service or is that looking after their chronic illness and their disability, which is more what NDIS was sort of set up to do. So there's a little bit of lack of clarity of how our service, which is, I think, disability medicine, so it's got an acute area, but it's got a disability area, and we're not represented in necessarily well in both areas. And that's part of our issue, part of the things that we want to speak about this afternoon. So thank you for that. I'd like to welcome back all of our panellists on to the virtual floor. And to begin our discussion moving forward, you can already see why our panellists are so perfect for this discussion, each in their own way, having a different or a unique view of the healthcare system and rehabilitation and their roles in it. I want us now to jump forward to 2030. And I want to introduce you to an author and a philosopher that I'm not sure many of you would have come across. In 1973, a gentleman by the name of FM2030, and only a futurist could have a title like that. So in 1973, he wrote a book called Up Wingers, and he spoke about reconfiguring society and unlocking human potential. It's quite an esoteric book, but there are a number of things in there that always tickle me. And one of his principles, I think, speaks beautifully to our conversation this afternoon. It, one of his principles he titles as Beyond Freedom. And he describes it as this. How free am I if I cannot choose my own body, my own brain, my own biological rhythms? How free am I trapped in a predetermined biological straitjacket in whose selection I have absolutely nothing to say. And he talks about a world where we might be able to mitigate that, a world where we might be able to alter that, where we as humans might be able to intervene in how our body functions, how we think and what we're capable of and what society is able to achieve for us. I think in many ways, even though it was written nearly 40 years ago, that it aligns with the World Health Framework on an integrated people-centered care places that, are, that rather than diseases are centers of health care. And I want to explore that 2030 landscape in more detail now and have a conversation amongst us all about what that might look like. And I would also welcome our audience to do similar, to pop conversation into the chat. And let's start thinking about where 2030 might be. Now, the world of 2030 is only 10 years away. It is not that far at all. Australia's population at the moment is sitting at about 25 million. By the time we get to 2030, we are going to be sitting at somewhere close to 31 million people. We will most probably still be living, despite the news at the moment, still be living in very much the same centres as we do now, more than likely begun to grow more regional sectors, but transportation and many other issues will not grow the regions in the way that we would like them to grow over the next 10 years or so. Some fun facts for no other reason. Milk. Two litres of milk in 2030 will cost $6. And if you think you're paying a lot for petrol at the moment, in 2030, it'll cost about $3 per litre. It's fairly likely that children born today, and definitely by 2030, will have a lifespan to 100 and beyond and work in the world of what I refer to as portfolio income, meaning that they will have multiple opportunities in which to make income, Living to 100, they'll most likely not retire in the way that we currently speak of, but rather decide not to work necessarily for money or as much time as they want and look for other opportunities to use skills and other opportunities to make income from. We'll also, as we've seen this year, be very much a global citizen working in a landscape across the globe. And as we have already experienced in this shared lived opportunity of the last 12 months, we will have built a community in which research, I think, will have a very, very different face to the one it's had in the last 10 years. In this world of 2030, a world that still has the same housing, still has many of the same cars that we're driving today, maybe autonomy is in that space somewhat, but not yet the fully autonomous vehicle, what will rehabilitation look like? What will it offer? How will we engage with it? What will become important and what will rehabilitation be at all? So I want to look at it from a multiplicity of angles. I want to ask what are the major differences between disability and rehabilitation practices today? 
and the approach, offering and deliveries we have today to those in 2030. And I'd like to start with you, Philip, asking the question of how do you think that those with lived experiences, patients, end users, might experience your uh, your uh, area of disability and rehabilitation in 2030? What might be different for them then? Um, I would hope that there will be a better transition from the acute phase into the community so that uh, there's uh, continued communication, there's con continued support, um, but uh, also much stronger uh, support and better knowledge about what is and isn't effective uh, in supporting people uh, in delivering services so that uh, people can actually achieve the best physical outcomes, but also the best psychological and the best life outcomes. What does rehabilitation mean in 2030, do you think? How do we view it? What is it? Rehabilitation. I mean, rehabilitation in 2030 will be what it should be today and what it is today, and that's about adapting to your new life, the new life that you, you, you are leading with um, a disability that, let's assume you have a disability that is, that is not uh, going to uh, go away. Uh, it's adapting to that new life. And John, Libby, Alyssa, any thoughts? on the changes between now and 2030 for our end users, those with lived experience, our patients? I'm, I'm uh, happy to say that uh, I think that the trend towards a lot more community-based rehabilitation therapy delivered in situations or environments that people are living in is often much more effective with my patients with traumatic brain injury they often can't generalise what we do in a hospital setting. Uh, however good the occupational therapist, Libby, if you're in a hospital kitchen, you can't necessarily translate the skills that you teach people there uh, or reteach people, a relearning process, uh, to what happens in their own kitchen. So we're seeing this transition to rehab in the home, therapy in the home. Uh, so that's one major thing. The other major thing is what we've experienced in the last six months, the absolute explosion of telehealth, video conferencing, tele telephone conferencing, which I've got to say our regional patients just love. Not being, getting a train at 6 o'clock in the morning to see me in more than at 10 o'clock and we can have a perfectly good chat for half an hour, both of us in comfortable surroundings uh, for review patients, uh, not necessarily for new patients, but... Um, that sort of revelation, which we've always suspected would work, but we've never had a chance to try it from a funding point of view. And now I think, hopefully, it'll be ongoing uh, in all both public and private health. And Libby or Alyssa? Um, I, sorry, just to add to that, I think I agree with everything John said there, and that would be a vision for 2030 that we want to see happen. I think hand in hand in that, we want to see that more self-directed funding. And I think, again, the NDIS has had a fabulous impact in giving people control of the funding they have for them to consider their goals and the types of supports they'd like to purchase. Now, that does at times need some support for decision making. Again, for people I work with at times, if they do have difficulties with executive function, then having that support is integral to planning out um, the purchasing of supports. But I would like to see, as well as what John's identified there, community-based services that are flexible, can be delivered digitally or face-to-face. -face. I would also like to see a greater capacity for people to have a choice in the types of supports that they use to um, harness their rehabilitation. I think we're still seeing issues with workforce capacity, particularly in allied health and rehabilitation. And unless we start to think about rehabilitation differently by 2030, we're going to continue to see allied health workforce gaps that mean there'll be some people that won't be able to choose the type of supports they need um, to achieve the rehabilitation they'd like to. So I'd like to see a 2030 where we have workforce capacity and we also have self-directed um, options uh, for people that would like to take up that as part of their rehabilitation planning. Um, what role I, do you... Th sorry. I'm sorry, I, was, I was just going to say I'd agree with that, but the one thing I would add to that is that I think it needs to be recognition that rehab 
is its own skill set. They are specialised clinicians. And so when we're looking at workforce capacity in the future, I would like to see better recognition of the skill set that is rehab. And, you know, what we're seeing at the moment is a number of NDIS providers coming online, particularly in Queensland, who have sprouted out of out of the wonderful realm that is NDIS. Um, however, a large proportion of them actually don't have that rehab skill set. And I think, as John said earlier, this is when things get a bit murky between rehab and whether we're health or disability. And in fact, we're both, um, I think as well. And I feel that, you know, we are disability um, providers. And so I think a 2030 also needs to reflect that ability for rehab to have a presence in that disability area and within that NDIS to support. Because what we're currently seeing is a real gap um, for those very vulnerable um, consumers who need that support in working out what they actually do need to have maintaining to move forward and to and to keep them from from losing that quality of life in that that new you know the the new normal or that their, their new you know redefining their lives and i think you know 2030 that has that incorporated in it will be really important as well and that really links back to philip's point around um, evidence-based rehabilitation, doesn't it? As well as John's touching on how we measure outcomes in 2030. What are the outcomes that we're looking for? What are the outcomes that our funding bodies are looking for? And how do we make sure that those are measured um, and considered as part of good policy and, and government investment? Do you think technology might pick up some of the heavy lifting of being able to measure that by 2030? Look, I would hope so, um, but it's been interesting that uh, the technology, one of one component of which is robotics to help with movement of both upper and lower limbs. And it, at the moment, we don't have that solid evidence um, that it's as good as we all hoped it would be. And certainly it's got a fear factor in, um, you know, will this take over the jobs of therapists? And it will never do that because I've never seen a machine, you know, reassure a person about the fear of falling when you start to uh, mobilise them. But um, I would hope that uh, some of, if, if um, plasticity, particularly of the brain or even the spinal cord, is all task specific repetition and robots can do that better than humans and we can. Um, simulate movement and be able to do a lot more in a half hour therapy session than you would necessarily with the therapist along, then I see robotics as an adjunct to what we do now. I don't, certainly don't see it as taking over. But I've got to say at the moment, um, probably my hospital wouldn't let me, but I wouldn't go out and spend hundreds of thousands on some of this equipment because it really isn't uh, as strong in terms of evidence-based outcomes as we were hoping for, but it is being developed all the time. So let's hope uh, pretty soon that we'll have robotics that will help. The other technology that I think has been talked about a lot and is there is some evidence for is what they call virtual reality, which is really simulating complex environments in the safety of a therapy environment. And therefore, you have the patient well practiced, you have the fear factor gone before they um, you know, get into a, a functional setting. And that seems to have some um, a common sense and there's a little bit of support even for very cheap equipment um, that, uh, you know, otherwise is um, advertised as gaming equipment in the, in the community. And there's a lot of work being done around that. I mean, I always say that I don't really much mind what it is today. I'm more interested in what its grand grandchildren will be. That the technology, as you say, is very embryonic, but it exists and the research has already begun and the thought process has begun to take us down that road. It will never be perfect. It will never be elegant or eloquent. But it, I think in some ways, some of what we see around technology, the exoskeleton, as you've spoken about, augmented reality, mixed reality, for me, more likely mixed reality, which is of a blend of both augmented and virtual both being used through the same headset or mechanism switching between what's appropriate for that situation and that patient or end user those sorts of things i'm i'm thinking will be part of a landscape the other thing that tickles my fancy is the notion that we speak about and have spoken about rehabilitation being for life and much of it occurs outside of a hospital or a fixed setting that 
if we start to move into our homes, as we already think we might do, with as we have them now, embryonic wearable devices, if we have smart speakers, which will one day be part of a home, if we have an understanding of how people are walking around their homes, how they're living in their homes, and we have that mechanism already with elderly, where we can tell by the gate whether they're walking appropriately, about whether they've risen from bed at the appropriate time, whether they've taken their medication. So what we have is somebody living in a, in a perhaps a sense of independence to their own ability and being able to be monitored discreetly by the outside world. To me, that seems to be a bonus. It's definitely not more than that, but it seems to be a bonus of allowing or offering people the joy of being at home with some sense of independence. And I would see a landscape where rehabilitation could definitely make use of that and allow the person to achieve beyond what they might otherwise be able to. Thoughts on that? Maybe if I could just add to Alyssa's point about how we Please. look at um, considering the quality of what might be delivered in what you've just described, Morris. I do yes. think um, we've just finished a systematic review of the evidence on technologies used for executive function support after brain injury. And what we've seen is this, this wonderful body of, of, of evidence around particular technology products that actually no longer exist in the market. And yet there's no evidence on the products that sit in our back pocket and that are being updated every day and now sit in a cost range of about $1,000 to $10,000 versus what we used to purchase in the $30,000 to $100,000 mark of products for inpatient rehabilitation. And I just don't think we're going to get um, to a point where we can hang research evidence on the products that exist, but we can build an evidence base to inform what you're describing there, Morris, about what are the functions we're looking for in people's lives to help them to be as independent as possible and to do the things they want to do. And so I think if we're thinking about how rapidly life changed this year with COVID and the introduction of telepractice, we're going to need to look at our research mechanisms if we're going to have an evidence base to draw from on the use of technology because it's just developing so quickly and being superseded so quickly. By the time we get a year's worth of data on a particular sort of product and its functionality, it will be superseded and we'll be publishing something that then actually will be talking about a product that um, is no longer what could be purchased. So if we think about 2030 and the sort of technologies that cannot provide that ambient assisted living that you just described, I think we're going to have to rethink the way we get evidence and we're going to need to really start again with the goals of the person, which we've all said today we must always do, but also a framework of how we look at features of technology and what they can offer to a person and that's something that we're now developing is what is our framework that we're going to take into any research project we're doing? What are the key things that this particular product race related to this person's goals must do? And I think we're going to need to move our researchers rapidly to, into another um, approach to evidence building that is fast and, um, and can be flexible and nimble uh, as products come and go if we're going to really have technology enablement by 2030 that is evidence-based and outcome-driven. Yeah, and to me, it, it begs the question of what research might be in 2030. Remember that what we will have in 2030 is the likelihood of information being amassed at that moment in that, in that situation. What we're not looking for is historical or, or uh, snapshot information anymore. We're actually being able to see real-time information either from a person wearing a wearable device, the devices around her or him in their homes, and all of those things that... Technology, our homes, will need to adapt to be able to achieve that. What I'm seeing is a world, not maybe by 2030, but certainly soon after that, where our technology... smart machines or whatever else, to be able to adapt the situation so that that person is achieving what they need to achieve. I, I think um, that, that's a good point. I agree with that. It, it, the problem that we always have in rehabilitation, and the data has said it right, is the gap between someone being independent and someone being dependent on a service that we offer. Uh, and if we don't get it right, we foster dependency. Uh, and if we don't get it right, we uh, make people independent when they're not really ready for it. So picking that fine line between support and, and a person reaching their maximum level of independence or their maximum potential 
um, as Philip said before, adapting, but reaching your maximum potential in adapting. And it's sometimes very, very hard to, to get that right. Uh, but I f firmly agree that the technology that we're starting to see now um, with development will be much more of a part of our rehabilitation, plus the simple ability to record um, your progress in apps on your phone and then showing that to the therapist or the doctor the next time you see them. And um, these apps are sort of springing up all over the place now. And again, they're, they're useful in, in a person sort of being able to remember and monitor um, how they're doing and they, they will be then the guidance for further treatment. Mm -hmm. one, of, one, of the, uh, one of the problems with uh, disorders like spinal cord injury and a brain injury is that there's enormous variability from client to client, patient to patient. And um, it's very hard to then just use case studies to, to try and make conclusions across them. There was a proposal from the Spinal Network some time ago to uh, put together an all of life register that gathers information about a um, very large number of people with spinal cord injury, acquired brain injury, uh, from the time of their injury through the acute phase into the community following, uh, following all aspects of their life, what activities they've been involved with, um, what social interactions, what therapies, uh, and then measuring outcomes to provide a database to enable those sorts of questions to be asked, what, what is effective, what is working, um, and, and it would need to be a very large database because there is so much variation from, from patient to patient and what they might be using, what sort of technology, what sort of support, um, so that you can actually drill down, get a subset, ask your question about bowel function or bladder function or um, you know, support outcomes and, um, and hopefully identify what are the most appropriate interventions and supports for those people. And there are many people online. Thank you for your comments. Please keep them coming. I, I will get to them if I can, but otherwise all of our panellists will attend to them after our conversation, who are talking about VR and AR and robotics and exoskeletons and making the comment that elsewhere in the world, in some instances, they are further ahead, but all of them seemingly talking about being embryonic, that maybe in the next 10 years, the conversation of these things might be far more ordinary than they are now. For me, it's, as I said, not the conversation about technology. I'm not championing the fact that we will have these apps. In fact, I, I actually believe in the next 10 years we will lose our apps and we will lose our mobile phones. They will split into a myriad of devices that will carry on in and around us. And those devices, regardless of our ability, will help to augment and change our world simply by being able to open doors, close doors, raising and, and changing levels of things and whatever else we require of it. But to me, the notion, the question behind all of this is, how it changes the expectation of the human living in a world where these things are possible and how will we accommodate that? Because I believe that there will be a an increase in demand from everybody rightly for equal and inclusive access to this world. I think that's going to be one of the big changes over the next 10 years, uh, this voice of demand. Thoughts on that? I think, I think in certain populations, yes. And then I think of other population groups that I look after who are not interested in technology, who don't, can't make a phone call in their house without going outside to stand on a shed roof or drive a pay down the road to be able to get internet access or who actually uh, have proactively avoiding technology at this stage of their lives. And whether that will change by 2030, who knows? But I do think too, it's important, and I, and I, I just want to add the caveat too, is when we're thinking 2030, let's hope that everyone in Australia actually has access to, you know, like has mobile reception and enough broadband reception in order to make any of these wonderful devices actually work. Because one thing we are finding is that these apps are great, but if you don't have the right level of broadband access or you don't have the right device or you don't have the right version, then you know if you have that digital poverty or you have that complete lack of platform, then it doesn't matter how great the technology is. Um, you still need to have another option in order to provide that, that, that service. So I, I do think there is a 
place for this, but there is always going to be a group as well that we need to consider the other option in. Sure. Um, and so, I, Alyssa, sorry. Alyssa, yeah, for me, it wasn't so much about the technology itself. It was the implications and applications it makes for the broad society. So it wasn't about the fact that the people may or may not, because I agree with you, we will still have lumpy and bumpy access. But what I what I was suggesting was that as the society becomes more aware of possibility, as it becomes richer and deeper in conversation, as rehabilitation begins to become what I believe will happen over the next few years, a more central part of our everyday conversation, that the demands of everybody will change. And those things to me are really not through technology, but are enabled through technology. So I'm talking really about societal change. It's impacted by technology being readily available. And to me, the technology also I'm talking about is simple things like social media, the ability for us to connect conversations, to find cohorts of people, to be able to connect into a global, into a global conversation. That's why I think that in the next 10 years, we are going to change the face of rehabilitation from a multiplicity of angles. It will not just be you wonderful practitioners who are doing the work that you have, but the rest of society also hopefully lifting and doing some of the heavy lifting towards that. Yeah, I think but, in but rehabilitation we try to um, look at what a person's potential is and even try and predict it. And sometimes people, the funding bodies are helping us to predict it. Where, where is this person going to go? Uh, and I think in, in um, 10 years' time, we'll be raising the bar. So what we thought was someone's maximum potential now uh, will go a step further. And, you know, a few years ago in my hospital, we, we had a therapist who wondered about why we uh, sort of stopped rehab when people were walking. What about a whole lot of people wanting to run? So with a PhD, did a running group. Now there's a running group, outcome measures, and everyone's doing it. But that was someone sort of saying, well, the potential could be higher. And I think technology is just one of those things that in 10 years' time will help maximise the potential of everyone that with a disability to a greater level and will change our thinking. Um, so I'll be wrong on what I've predicted for a lot of patients today. Thank you. And that, and that is my point, John, that as an outsider of this industry, I've always seen rehabilitation and don't forgive me for this because I do mean it. I've seen rehabilitation as having a ceiling. And whenever I see the word, I always, for whatever ill-advised understanding, have always thought that there is a potential beyond which is not possible. I don't think that anymore. And I haven't thought that for a very long time. But I think that in general society, we see it as a ceiling. There is an end point after which nothing really is purposeful or useful. And I'm, and I'm sensing that will disappear. That as a society, we will say that is no longer true. We are already, if I can use the example of the, uh, you know, the Olympics, the Paralympics, has become central to our conversation around the Olympic period. We actually enjoy it, look forward to it. We are making champions out of people who otherwise uh, might not have been a champion and not have been seen as a role model. They now are. I think that's going to change in the next 10 years. I, I truly believe society is growing up, if we can use that term, becoming more uh, comfortable with the conversation and that will begin to demand more. Now, I'm not saying that's going to be a Pollyanna. I'm not believing for a moment by 2030 we will have resolved everything. It will still be a lumpy and bumpy conversation and we will still not be well resourced. But I do believe we will make strides in the work that you are all doing, in the technology that enables the work to be, to be transmitted from what you want to achieve to the end user and also in society's uh, approach and demand to what rehabilitation and resilience can be. I agree. I think that there's that recovery element and there's the adaptation element to rehab. And I think what you're describing is how that, that ceiling used to be with, with the adaptation and where technology really fits as well. I mean, there's there's certainly, you know, as, as John and Libby have alluded to as well, that evidence isn't great for some of the recovery aids technology yet, like with the robotics work and, and so forth, but it's building. But what is really paramount is, is all of the other tech that you've described, which is more about that adaptation and the augmentation of lifestyle as opposed to a, you know, physical or, or um, cognitive recovery component to rehab. And I think people always used to think of it as just, we recover the body to a certain point, to the mind to a certain point, and we leave it be, you know, and that's where that, that sort of older concept of what rehab was. Whereas now we go so much further beyond that, look at how else we can improve, um, you know, a, a lifestyle or, or reintegrate um, with life roles through those adaptations and that augmentation. And I agree, I think that the, the real, you know, opportunity there is how technology enables that process as well. 
I, I'm really interested in listening to that discussion, Alyssa, and thinking about who will get rehab in 2030. And I often reflect on my beautiful father who, you know, as a working woman, my my parents um, minded our children a lot as my husband and I were working over the last, you know, 15 years. And I always looked at him up until the day he died and thought he was always such a good rehab candidate, you know, the golfer, the um, grandfather who was literally almost a primary carer at times. And I do wonder in 2030 when we hear Morris's reflection on our age and, and, um, uh, and what life is going to be like, what our population is going to be like, who is going to get rehabilitation and will our ageism and rehabilitation reduce a little, do you think? Do you think we'll be able to say that, that an older life is a valued life and that we should be um, ensuring that people people have that choice um, of, a few, of a good life even into older adulthood. Do you and, and, and John have comments on that as our two rehab consultants on the panel? Well, I think, Libby, that um, one of the things that I was hoping to bring into this discussion is one of the big changes in uh, the next 10 years uh, is the, um, in 2030, is the ageing population. Mm -hmm. And um, there have been a number of studies which indicate that you really have to approach how you deliver rehab in a different way to uh, people whose um, thinking functions may not have deteriorated to the effect that they're not independent in society, but they're different than they were when they were 18. Mm -hmm. We have to do, you know, change our, our thinking and our type of rehab. So I think uh, if I could call it aged care rehab, and I don't like that term, but it, rehab of an ageing population we have to think a bit more outside the box than we're doing now and set up programs that would help. My other small comment is that there's no better rehab uh, for an elderly person looking after your grandchildren. <laughs> so I kept telling my parents, John. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm a general rehab physician, so I look after the, the mm. spectrum. And so, yeah, we, we see a number of our, our, our consumers coming through who are older Patients and also those who have lived with their disability for a very long period of time and are then having changes later on that then warrant a relook at how we've been living our lives and, and what their rehabs in, and do a different type of rehab there. And I, I absolutely agree. We we certainly talk about ourselves. A couple of phrases we love is the um we're not ageist, like there's no age limit or or low. I mean, rehab starts at peds and goes right through to end of life. You know, we do what we call more so habilitation rather than Big amounts of rehabilitation in cancer rehab, but that's another group that's very, you know, that's a very specific group that has their own trajectory and still benefits from rehab um, to get to get their quality of life to a certain level and slow down the deterioration. And uh, you know, that we do talk about it as geriatric rehab because there's different schools of thought around who delivers it and what needs to be considered. But absolutely, having rehabilitation that's targeted to you know, different types of people within our society doesn't mean that they're any less worthy of rehab or, or should, you know, warrant having that rehab. It just changes the way we tackle it. I mean, I do, my, my rehab's delivered differently to someone with, a, you know, traumatic brain injury to an amputee. It's just, it's different. Um, it doesn't mean the outcomes are any less or, or any less important. Um, yeah, and I guess the only other um, thing I was going to get, I can see Philip nodding down there about something as well. So I was going to let him have a chat. Um, but I think it's the, the 2030 is, is certainly looking at how we deliver that in a way that meets each of those groups' needs, um, in a way that works for each of them. And the other thing I was going to say is before, some of that technology is fabulous, but if you have major cognitive impairment or you are aphasic, I have a global aphasia, then your ability to use some of that technology may impact, impact it. And I'd like to see the technology evolving uh, evolving with time to to really take that into consideration because a lot of our aphasic patients are missing out at this stage and you know could be getting a lot more and philip a lot of a lot of our focus and um, and the focus of, of the rehab community is on those physical interventions the adaptive equipment the uh, you know the, but, but there's a huge issue that is being overlooked and that's the psychological aspects of rehabilitation. And, and to, in, in my area, knowing uh, what's happened to some of the people that I've seen over um, my 15 years um, with a spinal cord injury, I think there are possibly as many as 50% of people who 
are completely withdrawn from um, rehabilitation. They're completely withdrawn from life. And, it, you know, it's, a, it's such a tragedy. And it is, I don't know, um, you know, you can talk about resilience, you can talk about support system. Um, I don't know what you can do about it. Um, it's, it's such an important issue. And, and just actually, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll give you one of my little case studies. It's, uh, it's a very short one. Um, on a, um, a social media platform uh, for spinal cord injuries, a woman um, wrote in and, and, uh, about her husband. And did, uh, well, notably, it's a, uh, the, the wife who's writing in, not the person with his disability, saying, what's normal? My husband uh, had a, he was a paraplegic uh, uh, two years ago. He initially was in his chair most of the time, doing his physical um, activities. He was he was doing quite well. He got some edema, uh, and now he spends all of his time in bed, uh, napping or watching television, and only gets up to shower. And that's it. And, he, and she was saying, "What's the likelihood of the answer out there in the community? Are you doing this?" And the whole bunch of people wrote that, saying, "I'm doing this. I work you know six days a week. I've got kids." I've, you know, everything's going fantastically. But of course, they're the ones that are engaged. They're the ones that are successful. The ones that you don't hear about are the mm -hmm. ones stuck at home, feeling not just feeling sorry for themselves, but withdrawn from life. Mm -hmm. and, and it's such a tragedy. That connection. And, and that's our challenge moving forward. That rehabilitation itself as a service will definitely evolve over the next 10 years. Technology, I think, will become an, a, an increasingly useful conduit between providing it and those people that require it. But we still have a cohort of humanity that may not be able to access it for a whole lot of reasons. And that's the landscape of 2030, I think, for all of us. We also, uh, there's also a provocative comment or a provocative thought I tend to throw in, and that's the notion of prehabilitation. We talk about baby boomers who are, like me, likely to live longer than before in relatively good health. The prehabilitation to me is a, is a field that is worth exploring, at least if for no other reason, to, to understand what rehabilitation might be. And that's keeping me in moderately good health so that I don't require rehabilitation moving forward. And, and that's part of an argument as well. I think that's well worth discussing another topic on another day. So I wanted us to think then about this year. We have all been through COVID. We have all had that lived experience and all those other platitudes that we've heard over the last 12 months. There is nothing good to be said or made out of it. But having put that, but let's put that to a side as difficult as it is. We spoke earlier that perhaps there are things that we can take out of COVID, techniques that we've tried, technologies that we've adapted, new practices that we might have trialled. I'd love for us to go around and as a closing comment for each of us to talk about what it is that we want to take out of COVID. What is it that we've done this year that we think is worthwhile and should become a part of this rehabilitation resilient landscape moving forward? Who wants to kick us off? I'm happy to, and it probably touches on something Alyssa just talked about, which is how we right. include, include people that might have um, very specialised needs. Uh, Alyssa was talking about people who experience aphasia. Uh, some of our work through COVID has been um, using telepractice to provide um, allied health supports into supported housing down in Tasmania for NDIS participants with very complex and multiple support needs. So people that might experience disability from birth and have um, impacts on cognitive, communication and behavioural um, um, needs. And I think what we've had to really do, much more than I've ever had to do in rehabilitation before, is really think about tailoring the way we communicate with each person so they can get the absolute maximum out of each interaction. When you have the luxury of being face to face with someone and using body language and um, being able to gesture and point to things, it can make a difference. But, but in the telepractice environment, we had to really be creative about how we were going to ensure this person that was receiving this telepractice based support was going to understand what we were talking about and was going to have the opportunity to contribute their perspectives, particularly where they may have behaviours that impacted upon their responses or where they may have that expressive or receptive communication issue. So things like using 
The most customised approaches to communication in our rehabilitation became central in that project. And some of the innovations that came out of um, different ways of ensuring that the voice of the person who was receiving supports was well and truly heard, or if it wasn't their voice for some who didn't have a voice, there were other ways their perspectives were shared, whether that was through photos or artefacts or other things they could bring to a session relating to their goals for that therapy intervention. Um, was absolutely key. So that that I guess what I'm saying is that um, very innovative and very tailored and customised approach to communicating in a two way manner in rehabilitation. If we can keep that central to whatever the way is that we're going to be delivering uh, allied health services in rehabilitation to people, I think that will be very very valuable moving forward. It's extraordinary how we've accelerated our thinking and our beliefs in what can be done over the last year or so online and please keep the comments coming of what you would like to see us maintain out of COVID. Tim said that we need to continue to break down the bureaucratic departmental silos that still exist between health, rehabilitation and disability, which for example led to the uh, led to the anyone over the age of 55 being excluded from access to the NDIS. So thank you for those comments and please keep them coming. Uh, John, what is it that you would like us to take and maintain out of this year of lived and shared experiences? Well, it's been an interesting year. As part of the communication, I had to do an interview with our CEO. He interviewed me and said, um, well, what's this year being like compared to any other year? And I pointed out that in health, you have to be adaptable. Things change all the time. And if you can't manage change, then you don't do too well. Um, but this year has to be one out of the box in terms of being adaptable. And by uh, having to increase our adaptability, we've uh, explored things that we never really thought were going to happen in my lifetime. And, uh, you know, telehealth or video conferencing, I've been surprised by how the patients respond to it and, and actually really like it and are saying to us, um, you know, you've got to keep on doing this. You know, happy to see you face to face if I've got to be examined or if I've got you know, a particular thing I want to discuss, but um, that's been a, a major change. So I think this year has taught me a lot about adaptability. Our therapists have had to adapt. One of our programs, Cardiac Rehab, there's a, a Cardi Rehab program that's all telehealth. Who would have thought you could deliver cardiac rehab by, by telehealth? And yet again, it's been successful with enormous sort of feedback. Being able to, de to deliver programs at different times of the day because when we were able to bring patients in, we couldn't fit them into the rooms because of the social distancing. So we had to expand the times we were doing therapy in order to, so all of this thinking, it's just totally changed the landscape. And I think much of this will be consolidated and uh, be really working well by uh, 2030. So I think the, the thing I've learned is adaptability and the specific thing I've loved about it is uh, telehealth. Thank you for that. Your Wednesdays have changed dramatically, you were telling me too. Well, I'm, I'm working from home uh, on Wednesdays. I don't know for how much longer, but, um, you know, the, the problem with working from home, I find, is like today, I've been sitting in this, uh, at this desk since 8 o'clock this morning, and it's just been one after the other, so I think I need to go back to work on Wednesdays to have a rest. <laughs> There's a lot of that going around. It, it isn't as easy as we once thought it would be. Thank okay. you for that. And Alyssa, your take out from this year? Uh, much, much like John's and probably following on from there, I, I love the adaptability, but I would really like us to stay out of our comfort zones. So COVID took a lot of clinicians out of our comfort zones to try new things, to, to do that adaptability, try different ways of delivering. And I, I already see it happening you know, at this stage where the crisis has come down a little bit, so everyone's just reverting back to how things were. And I'd really like to see us continue to push those barriers and keep, stay out of the comfort zone, keep trying the new things. And I guess one of the big things with that is really pushing forward to see how we can deliver therapy in some of these new constructs, if we can, and if it's efficient to do so. Because one of the things that tele, you know, telehealth has been really good for is assessment and initial consultations. But one of the things that we seem to still be struggling with is actually how to provide certain therapies in those entities. And there's a lot of fear around that. And I think there's still there's still great work to be done 
around what modalities we could use and which, you know, what technology we can use to assist with that when we're doing those sorts of, of activities and what's usable and what's cheap because, you know, lots of the gaming apps already have ways to track body movements and things like that. We just have to get clever with how we do it. But for me, it's about staying, now that we've taken that step out and we've gotten adaptable, it's, it's keeping that momentum going and how we keep out of that comfort zone and don't just slip back in. Absolutely. Let's not go back. Let's go forward. It's been my mantra for this year. So online, we have Kathy, who's answered by saying that she would like to take out of this year into the future is telehealth and video conferencing and uh, also more person-centred offerings from services. So certainly we're all feeling, even though there has been great tragedy out of this year and not much that we can take out that, that makes us joyful, there are lived experiences that have accelerated us forward into that new space. And Philip, for you, what is it that you want to take forward out of this year? Well, first of all, a comment on telehealth. Uh, you know, it's not the solution to everything. As an example, uh, I saw a photograph the other day of, uh, and it's a joke, of a, uh, a sheepdog sitting in front of a, a computer monitor with a flock of sheep on the screen with a caption saying, I'm working remotely today. So, so my point is some things have to be hands-on. If you need to be manipulated by your physiotherapist, twisted in half, um, it, it, you really do need those face-to-face, uh, -face, hands-on experiences for um, a lot of the interventions we're talking about. From uh, lessons to be learned from COVID-19, I'd like to see uh, governments think a little bit more about um, interventions that they've introduced and perhaps even if they do something wrong to be a little bit more responsive. And as an example, JobKeeper was a fantastic system to save people's jobs, but for um, personal support workers, for example, they're casual, um, they were on JobKeeper, they were earning more money than they were when they were working casually, and they didn't have to work. So what we found is that um, a lot of people with spinal cord injuries just couldn't get support workers to fill their shifts because they were either sitting at home doing nothing and earning $1,500 a fortnight, or they were getting the $1,500 a fortnight and going out and getting other casual jobs. So, uh, you, know, that, you know, that's some harm that the government's well-meaning, well-intentioned uh, interventions actually caused. Thank you for that. So as we've seen this afternoon, the future is very much like the past. It's lumpy and bumpy. But the reality is that moving forward, we will be living in a dynamic world, a world where the technology around us will help us to interrogate and find answers to things that we never knew before. We will have a far deeper and richer understanding of the human mind and the human body than we've had before. There will be much that 20, that the next 10 years can offer us and much in the way that it will change who we are and what we offer. Rehabilitation, I think, will also become a more central conversation around health and allied care and certainly more of a conversation in general society. There is much that we need to do. We're going to move, I believe, from, from a centralised to a distributed model where we see more and more cases in community and in people's home. Of course, the person-centric nature of it to me will be the biggest change across all industries. We're moving into an autonomous age, and that's not about cars. That's about our technology, understanding who and where we are. And I accept the fact that not everybody has equal access to it, but technology will be an underpinning to all of this. But above and beyond any of this discussion, it is about humanity. Each and every one of us particip participating this afternoon is doing it because we value the human. We understand that the human is in a space where they don't want to be and need to be in some other state or being, and we are capable of assisting them to get there. It's the humanity that brings us all to this screen and the shared experiences that allows us to have this conversation and many, many more. I want to thank you all for joining me this afternoon, but more importantly, I would like on your behalf to thank our most incredible panelists and for your comments as well. I'd like, of course, to thank Dr. Alyssa Farrow. Thank you very, very much for joining us. I'd love, of course, to thank Libby Calloway, John Oliver, 
and Philip Morris for so readily participating in this conversation, for sharing so deeply and wisely with us the future ahead. At the end of this, we are left with the question, what will Rehabilitation 2030 look like? And the only people that I can think of to answer that is you, the people watching this. So I look forward to having and to, to having that discussion with you over the next days, weeks, months and years. And more importantly, to seeing how collectively we can build on what rehabilitation is, its achievements of the past and what it will become into tomorrow's landscape. So thank you all for joining me and our panel this afternoon. I'd also like to thank Carla behind the scenes for doing the most incredible structural work and putting this all together. Truly, we would not be here if it was not for her. And Jason, who's hiding behind the screen that he's turned off for making sure all the IT has worked so beautifully. Thank you again to our panelists and to each and every one of you for joining us this afternoon. And I look forward to continuing this conversation and many more with you well into the future. Back to you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Morris, and thank you to everyone who joined us for this session. I really especially want to thank uh, our four panellists. They're definitely speakers who are at the forefront of, of their own areas and they're each very open to doing things differently. And I think that I was reminded listening to everyone speaking that that really is how we're going to move forward is, is um, as Alyssa says, not staying in our comfort zone. Um, but I was also reminded listening to everyone that uh, technology is absolutely amazing at the moment. There's some incredible things happening, um, but then we, we're a long way away from that becoming an embedded way in rehabilitation and disability services. So we have a lot of work to do. Uh, one of the things that I was reminded of uh, while you were all speaking is a film I recently saw of a man who had lost three limbs, um, both legs and an arm. And he was interviewed about the bionic revolution. Uh, and he, he so carefully said, uh, look, if I can have prosthetic legs, I don't want to be just like you. I want to be way better. And I thought that was that was really telling, particularly putting uh, John's comments behind that, you know, that let's not put caps on pe what people can do because we just don't know what they'll be able to do in the future. A um, couple of take home points for me, things that came out um, from comments and from um, from speakers is that we really do need to spend a little more time promoting rehabilitation and building a coherent discipline that that really is acknowledged for these amazing contributions that it can make both to recovery and to adaptation over time. And to do that, we really need to recognise that that rehab has no end date. It's something that people do all through their lives. And we need a workforce that has flexibility and, and capacity and openness as to some of the new technologies that are out there that we don't even know how to apply yet. Um, but we've made a start with, with tele rehab and, and various other uh, virtual reality initiatives that the speakers spoke about today. Um, but we've got to always keep that focus on self direction, choice, control, the person's preferences, and being able to work in the person's own environment and, um, and actually cross boundaries whenever we can. Uh, so I think probably. My biggest take home point is that we always need to stop and think, is this equitable? Are we doing things in a way that everyone can access? And I think Philip's points there and Libby's points uh, were so important for us to always keep in mind. It might be great to have some fantastic technology and we can do some of these things, but are we doing it for everyone? And are we doing it in a way that everyone can join us? So, so I really thank the speakers for those amazing points. Alyssa, John, Libby, Philip, thank you for your time. And Morris, especially, thank you for leading us through this important conversation. I'm looking forward to what the next iteration might be when we can perhaps start talking about some of the really amazing technologies um, that are maybe 2050. Anyway, we'll come back for that one. Um, so thank you again for joining us today and thank you to everyone who made it happen, to our sponsors, to Makala and everyone uh, who has technological skills beyond mine. Uh, I really encourage you also to acknowledge 
people with disabilities tomorrow and wear purple. Uh, the United Nations is asking us all to wear purple. I will put purple on your banner behind you and uh, and celebrate the achievements that we know are possible if we uh, deliver good rehabilitation. Thank you, everyone.